So I just want to, because we've been chatting for a lot and there's a lot we've covered, which is fantastic. What I'd love to get, you, you talk about some opportunities. Oh. Where where are you th- seeing the opportunities here? Because it's very difficult for most people to get their heads around what's shit and what is gold within this. <laughs> yeah. And there's, and, yeah. And, and, you're you're going through nuggets and you have to know uh, what you're doing. One way of thinking about it for sure. But I, I think <laughs> there are, yeah, there are plenty of opportunities for patient capital. And to provide a metaphor, one consistent observation across all the largest pools of global capital who I advise is that they've all been nibbling in this sell-off. No one's trying to pick a bottom. No one's trying to predict a bottom. Why they're deploying capital into very specific assets and sectors based entirely on valuation. And I think that's important for all of us because we can read every COVID model we like. I don't think that's going to give us much insight into how to deploy capital. It might make us informed, but it's not going to tell us how to value a security that might be on sale at an enormous discount. So I think that metaphor of nibbling, and to be very precise, there is capital being deployed at the top of the US credit markets. So AAA CLOs. And just an anecdote, I know I keep saying just an anecdote, but I'm trying to make it tangible for your subscribers. There was a strange Bloomberg story last week, and I think it was ill-advised if true, that Citigroup had made $100 million by buying a AAA CLO tranche from Prudential Investments. Now, that's a very strange transaction because first, why would the PRU, of all people, given they're fully funded, need to sell a bulletproof, and they are bulletproof, AAA CLO tranche in the low 90 range? It doesn't make any sense. And yet Citigroup had the balance sheet to take the other side. And the reason I share that is because I think it reminds us how different this is to 2008. Because in 2008, it would have been Citigroup spraying stuff everywhere to the buy side. And now it's Citigroup that has the liquidity to allow the buy side to sell. And it tells you where a lot of this risk is held, hopefully in a sensible way. So there is capital being deployed, very specifically senior secured credit for those who have read their prospectus, AAA CLOs, But obviously, this money that's dribbling in to US credit up in the bulletproof tranches is not nearly enough to offset the potential supply and disruption to come, let alone offset anything people might need to distribute in high yield. Now, there's a very important technical point when we think about opportunity and solvency. On March the 24th, ICE BAML indices said that they were going to take a rain check on rebalancing their credit and fixed income indices at the end of last month. Now, that's very interesting. And then the other index providers, including Bloomberg to a degree, followed on. And that actually gave the credit markets a lot of breathing room because if the rebalancings had gone ahead as planned, well, there would have been a tremendous amount of liquidation in all sorts of credit, which the market would not have absorbed. And it would have been particularly problematic for the vanguards of this world and all the passive bond funds. And they've postponed that to April 30th. And the point I'm flagging here is there will be plenty more opportunities in credit for the professional credit investor and the long-only credit investor because they're able to name their price and they're able to hold on rather than picking a bottom in all this other stuff. I mean, we could talk about credit in more detail afterwards, but I want to come back to equities as well. And I think we all need to be very careful here, especially now, uh, given the uncertainty to try to stay within our circle of competence. And to be very frank with your subscribers, some of my friends would argue, I'd even argue whether energy more at the broadest level is within my circle of confidence, a competence. Although you and I know many very, very smart energy investors who have done phenomenally well in all sorts of market conditions. Now, let's think about numbers. Potentially over the next week, there may be some agreement between major energy producers that takes 10 million barrels a day of supply off market, perhaps by May. On the other hand, if you look at what Trafigura and other leading oil firms are saying, demand reduction right now, as a result of the things we've been discussing in the energy markets, is running somewhere around 30 to 35 million barrels a day. 
a day. Oh, so if I take 10 million barrels of capacity off market, the frank answer is, so what? Why should we care? And if I go down another layer and I turn on the Bloomberg and I look at all these product and spread products and all down the energy food chain, it kind of roughly comes out with a market clearing price of oil, let's just call it broadly oil, somewhere in the low teens. So you think to yourself, uh-oh, there's a lot more reckoning to come. It is, however, striking that in the context of that, which every oil professional knows, that some of the better shale and large cap energy stocks have stopped going down because eventually they discount the worst case scenario. And we need to sharpen our pencils here, but we're in the process of what you might call the shale reckoning or the shale restructuring that was postponed in 2016. And we're on the front edge of that. There will be consolidation. People will need to tie their balance sheets to the ground, but there will be winners. And at some point, despite this supply dispute, despite the demand destruction today, we will need the oil and we will need these companies, no matter as a sidebar, whatever people tell us about ESG. If we're going to restart the global economy, we need these companies and we need the shale companies in particular. So if I dare to think about what's not in the price, I look at what, again, to use that metaphor, our friends down in Texas, the really sharp guys are doing, and I say, okay, I'm watching what they're doing. I'm doing my own homework about the liquidity on the balance sheet and the funding and the hedging, of course, and the break-evens of some of these companies that I imagine might last. So it might be the Devon Energies, the EOGs, the WPX, you know, those sorts of things, Parsley Energy. And then, of course, I'm thinking about Chevron, Exxon, and Hess. And then I might be thinking about Woodside and Australia. It really depends. But the point is, I am very carefully, I don't trade, but I'm very carefully deploying some of my liquidity buffer, which I've had for a long time, into some of these companies. Equity, knowing equity or bond? Equity. Equity. And I'm doing so knowing that the demand destruction is staring at me in the face. Yeah. I do so knowing that I'm very likely to be punched in the face again if I miss the market, but I'm prepared to absorb that because I think myself there's long-term value in these particular and, companies. And do you think that the shale credit market has priced much of this in as well? I mean, look, it's not going to be com sure. completely correctly priced, but everyone kind of knows it's all going bankrupt and somewhere within that you're going to find some real gems, as, as exactly as you say, right. but... Do you think it's all priced in? Or do you think there's a bit more ugliness still to come? Put it this way, if I'm a shale producer and I couldn't refinance at the end of 2019, which was the greatest credit and liquidity bubble of all time, I'm dead. And I think it's QCIP by QCIP. Mr. Yeah. Market is identifying yeah. it company by company. There's a long way to go yet. 